morning, everybody. Time for announcements. We'd like to welcome everyone to Bible Lutheran Church this morning. We've got very few announcements, so listen carefully. We have Sandra and Walton. I see Walton here back there celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary next Friday night here from 6 to 8. And everybody is invited. So you know the food's going to be wonderful and you know the company's going to be wonderful. So drop by, it says, share a meal, congregation for the happy couple. So, right, Walton? 50 years. <laughs> Are there any other announcements that need to come before the congregation this morning? All right. Are there any prayer requests this morning? You can go ahead, you can go ahead. Pastor Dave, um, I'd like to put in a prayer request for Matt Jimlatt family for the loss of his wife, Maggie. Can you spell the last name? Um, you know, that, that would be a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Jim Lapp, but I, it, it's spelled a little bit funny, and I don't know if I could... Oh, you get it to me later. I'll do it phonetically here. Jim Lapp, you said? Okay, and, and the wife, Maggie, passed? <coughs> they grew up across the street with me, so uh, I, I think I know about how to spell it, man, but I have to write it down for you. It'd be hard for me to tell you. All right, <laughs> sure. Why don't you get it to me so I can get it right in the prayer list? Uh, we're going to pray for Miss Harriet, who fell and broke her wrist yesterday, and uh, I'm still a bit achy and sore, I'm sure. Um, we're going to pray for the Royal family on the death of um, Don's father, Don Hasty. We're going to uh, continue to pray that God bring healing to Sherry Ron after her surgery, what went well for her, and she's home recovering now, and continue to pray for Steve Everett as he recovers from his his hip. Are there any other requests? Okay, it's summertime. It's uh, liturgy light, so to speak, and um, today's message will be from Galatians 5, where Paul talks about the fruits of the Spirit, and I will talk a little bit about that, but uh, actually try to take this text to the, the hot button of the moment uh, this week, which of course was the Supreme Court decision on abortion. So um, pray that God be with us as we consider these things. If there's no other um, prayer requests, let me get these up to the altar first. <coughs> We have no acolyte, so let me light the candles. Now we prepare our hearts for worship. Please rise and we'll sing the first hymn when the roll 
is called up yonder. It is the insert sheet. our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no a sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his only son to die for us, and for his sake he forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the forgiveness of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the Holy Communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Let us pray to the Lord for peace. Lord, have Let us pray to the Lord for salvation. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray to the Lord for the well-being of the world and the unity of the church of God. Lord, Let us pray for this holy house as we offer God our worship and praise. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you joys beyond understanding. Pour into our hearts such love for you, that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The 
first reading is from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, starting at the second part of verse 9 and continuing to verse 21. And that can be found on page 354 in the Pew Bible. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall put Jehu to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. Here ends the first reading. The second reading is from the book of Galatians, chapter 5, beginning at one, verse, verse 1, and that can be found on page 1157 in the Pew Bible. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Here ends the second reading. Okay, children, you get pastor today. If you want to come forward, please. Just have a little seat there in front of me. Anybody else coming? Oh boy, I get David and Luna. I see banana. Oh, you did? So I wanted to ask a question. I'm going to preach on the text that talks about fruits of the Spirit. So are you a vegetable person or a fruit person? Would you rather eat a carrot, which is orange, or an orange, which is orange? <laughs> You want to eat the banana. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a, a bowl of fruit here. What is this? I bet you know. What do you know? Uh, it's kind of brown, though. It's not my favorite stage. But. I like it. Okay. Is, is that a fruit or a vegetable? Vegetable. It's a fruit. In fact, all of these are fruits in here. What's this? An apple. Uh huh. Yep. It's an apple. What's this? Uh, an orange. What's this? A blueberry. Mm, that's too big for a blueberry. Want to try again? Mm, no, I don't know. It's a cherry. Cherry! Have you ever had a cherry? No. Oh. Time to get some cherries out. <laughs> what about this? Ooh, blueberry. Still too big for a blueberry. Cherry. No. Black grapes. Ooh. What? Now you've had grapes. Yeah, we have grapes. What's this? An avocado, which is a fruit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Can it's not take, very sweet. Let me take some of it home. Well, after the end of service, I may give you my banana if you really want it. I'll, I'll like yeah, the other banana. I'll like the apple. Or I might yeah. give you the apple. I might give you the whole bowl. How's that? Then you can have your cherry and your grapes. But that's after service is over. Well, I don't know. We just want one. Okay. So I, want, I want the cheese. Let me, tell you what, let me tell you what the Bible's trying to teach us. All of those fruits grow on some kind of different tree, right? So you've got an apple tree, an orange tree, a banana tree. And each tree a grows. A tree? Well, they're kind of like a palm tree what looking thing. What about a coconut tree? Well, yeah, a coconut tree. <laughs> So you've got all those different trees, but can you picture in your mind a tree no. that grows all of those fruits at the same time? No. So let's say an apple tree, but it also had cherries and grapes and bananas and everything. Wouldn't that be interesting? I didn't know you were, you were doing it today. I didn't either until this week, but I'm glad to do it. So listen now. You have done it That before. tree with all those fruits on it is a picture from our lesson today about how our life should be. We should be like a fruit tree that has all kinds of different fruit growing in our lives, only not this kind of fruit. <laughs> Here's the kind of fruit the Bible wants us to grow. Kindness, goodness, right? It says self-control. Do you know what that means? No. That means not being uh, rude or having outbursts of anger or things like that. This means just being, I can, I can keep my emotions in control. Um, what are some? Joy, peace. You know how it's good when you feel peace inside. You know what it's like to be happy. Love. You know what love is like. All of those, the Bible says, are kind of like spiritual fruits. And God wants those spiritual fruits to be in our lives. If you get something, you don't, you don't, if you get something, you get what you get and you don't fit your fit. You get what you get and you don't fit your fit. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Which is a way of saying you're grateful for what you get and you thank the person for their gift. Okay. Well, that's what this bowl of fruit was about. God wants us to bear spiritual fruit, all of us, 
all of those kinds of spiritual fruits on the one tree of our life. The adults understand this much better. But joy, peace, happiness, kindness, goodness, self-control, these are the kinds of ways we should live. If you get some flowers for a girl, they like they just take it. That would be nice. Yeah, it would. They, they yeah. Say well, that's what goodness means, being nice to others. Okay, let's say our prayer. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus help, me to be help me to be a fruitful tree. A fruitful tree. Amen. Amen. Okay, Miss Carolyn's going to give you your little things over there. You can go back to your seats. Don't forget to plant your fruit after service here. Now, the Holy Gospel. It is from St. Luke, chapter 9. Uh, let, I'm sorry, let's sing the Gospel verse first. <laughs> When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. And as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But the man said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And this is the gospel of our Lord. Okay, dear saints of God, the world is at war today. The war in Ukraine, there's actually other little wars going on around the world as well. Of course, there's our natural, national culture wars that I'm going to address here in just a second, part of it at least. And you and I are at war as well, according to our second lesson today from Galatians. Our war is spiritual. St. Paul speaks of it here as the conflict between our new life lived under the Holy Spirit of God and our old life of sin, which St. Paul calls the desires of the flesh. And that is a battle that all Christians wage every day of their lives till the day they die. That war never goes away because perfection doesn't come until heaven. Now, in every human heart, this war against sinful nature is a battle all of us should take seriously. 
if we let sin have its way in our lives, then bad things happen. We harm ourselves, we harm others, we degrade society and culture. Now let me address the topic of the week, which is the issue of abortion in the culture war. We wouldn't have such a large abortion problem in this nation if it weren't for sexual immorality. I don't point that finger at women. I point that finger at women and men who are humans and who are living in a way that God has said no. But it is the culture now, and you can see it all over the television just about all the time. Now, Christians aren't stupid or evil as the media portrays us. We know where babies come from, don't we? And that's why we guard the act of procreation with holy matrimony. So that when baby does come, we receive it into the world with love and protection, honoring its life as sacred as our own. We also know that there are times that hard choices have to be made to save a mother's life and well-being when she is pregnant. And certainly, if an abortion was necessary, it's a sad but understandable choice. Take, for example, what they call an ectoptic pre pregnancy when the egg is fertilized inside the, 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 the tube rather than the womb. So, again, we're not stupid. We understand medical science. <coughs> But for the most part in this nation, abortion is used for birth control rather than birth control, right? And I hear the political claims that this is the highest right for women to have the only and final say over their womb, and certainly as a man, I have no right to speak to that, I'm told. But I also hear God's claim on the infant's life, whom, according to Psalm 193, God wonderfully knits together in the womb. The womb is the workshop of God for life. And whom God can call for his purposes before even an infant is born, as he told the Jeremiah, prophet Jeremiah he had done in his life, Jeremiah 15. And whom God embraced in the incarnation in his own son, the state of being in the womb. In the war of flesh and the Holy Spirit of God, we Christians must honor God's will. And God's will is embedded in creation, in the binary sexual union. Those who are up on your LGBTQ stuff know how uh, that's a terrible thing to say, binary. Well, yeah, the male-female sexual union, which gives women, by the way, a great and wonderful responsibility because they have the womb and motherhood. It's also embedded God's will in the fifth commandment, which we talked about today in Sunday school class. You shall not murder. And men, as much as women, need to see this will of God, honor it in their girlfriend or their wife, and obey God's command to hold life sacred. So all of us, it's just human. Life, sacred to God. This is where the church has always stood and should stand, even though this is not where our culture is anymore. The war around abortion policy 
whether it should be a federal right or remanded to the states, as that's what this week was about, or what safeguards should be in place for the procedure in terms of how you run an abortion uh, facility, or whether abortion should be criminalized in any way. You know what? This war will continue to go on on a policy level, won't it? We Bible-believing Christians certainly have a right to have our say on this matter in the public square, no matter how loudly they try to shout us down in America. And we have our right to influence legislation from what we understand to be God's biblical point of view. But underneath this cultural war, I hear St. Paul urging us to pay attention to the war of God's spirit against our fallen human nature. Do you really respect life? Life in the womb? <laughs> life that is aged? Life that is suffering? The life of your neighbor? The life of your enemy? Is it all sacred to you, human life, so that what you would want to do for life is to love it, serve it, protect it, and lead it to see the grace of God in all things, rather than harm it or cancel it out of existence? The Spirit of God pours God's love into our hearts helps us discern God's spiritual truths and gives us the mind of Christ. That is why St. Paul tells us in the text today to live by, be led by, and to walk by the Spirit of God. Now there are other harmful, sinful desires that harm us that Paul lists, idolatry, that is, letting something other than God be the center of your sight, uh, of your life. Way back then, that literally might have meant some kind of temple in a statue somewhere where you're worshiping a false god, but today it probably means something more like this. You're worshiping yourself, or your money, or your power. If you don't have God as the center, if you don't value life the way God does, then it's easy to let jealousy and hatred lead to outbursts of anger and strife, which leads to dissensions and divisions and even gang violence. Sounds rather like our current world and political process, doesn't it? If we forget the daily war which we fight, the war of the Holy Spirit in our flesh against our sin, we can easily lose a good conscience within and civil peace without. I'm telling you, husbands, go home and start beating the snot out of your wives, and do you think that will put her on your good side? No. I'm telling you, go home, ladies, and nag your husband to the nth degree. Do you think that'll put him on your good side? No. You'll lose your civil peace, if not your mind, right? So, yeah, we have to pay attention to this in our lives. And it seems to me that from the viewpoint of the human moment, our group wars, our cultural wars seem most important, and they are important, don't get me wrong. But from the viewpoint of eternity, the war fought in the individual soul against sin and evil is most important of all because it has eternal consequences. Lose that war, and you just might lose Christ himself, God forbid. Now let me close with the word about the fruits of the Spirit that St. Paul speaks today in our text. Fruits aren't made, they grow. I mean, you can make plastic fruit, but you can't eat it, right? Real fruit grows. So, love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These virtues and values of the spiritual soul that the Bible gives us. It's really hard to make these things happen by focusing on making these things happen. That's not how fruits grow. You just don't wake up and go, I'm going to be gentle today. <clears throat> so, for example, you can try to make yourself joyful, but we all know that true happiness is really a byproduct of loving others and being loved in return. You don't make yourself happy. You love yourself happy and are loved in return, right? You can work on self-control by hedging your soul around with all kinds of commandments to yourself, by telling your soul no all the time to this, that, and the other thing. This also doesn't work very well, as St. Paul reminds us in Romans 7, where he confesses that sin is so strong it overpowers the law of God and say no to sin only provokes the sinful nature within you to be even stronger. So you can't make yourself do self-control by the law, Paul says. He says of that issue, who will deliver me from this body that keeps leading me to death? And his answer is this, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Christians develop self-control by testing and approving the will of God as their minds are transformed to see things differently in Christ. That comes out of Romans chapter 12. In other words, we don't make ourselves holy by self-control. We learn self-control as the Holy Spirit leads us to Christ and teaches us Christ and makes us like Christ. There's a transformation of the mind and of the heart that we go through, and we call that sanctification. Last night, the starting pitcher of the Los Angeles Dodgers had a tattoo on his neck that caught my attention. And I think I saw it well enough at one point to say that it said this, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Now, he didn't win the battle of the baseball game. The Braves won. Woohoo! But it seems to me that he's winning the battle of the soul. And who knew? Here's the final point I would make today. Your Christian religion is not simply a system of rules and regulations that you follow in the hope that you are pleasing God, and if you're good enough, he'll let you into his heaven. Rather, it is the giving of your life on the inside to the love of God in the way of Christ as you walk daily under the tutelage of the Holy Spirit. You are fighting a spiritual battle to become holy as God is holy, and you are a fruit tree planted in the soil of Calvary, meant to bear spiritual fruits in an evil world. And don't forget, while you are in this battle of bearing spiritual fruit, you don't do it to save yourself. You do it to please the God you love and to attract others to Christ who gave himself for you and them. So, yeah, we are in warfare, my friends, and we're always in warfare, and the real warfare that matters the most, according to the Bible, is the one that's in here. May your branches be heavy with the fruits of the Spirit of God every day, and every way. Amen. <coughs>
Let us pray. Help us, O God, indeed, to bear spiritual fruit that we may be your witnesses in the world, O Lord. And when we fall short in any way, remind us of the forgiveness you give us in Jesus. Amen. Now, if you'll please stand, let us sing hymn 480, that the Lord would guide my ways. of that hymn is from the 1600s. Can you feel the church? Let's pray, uh, I mean, let's confess now the faith of the church with our baptismal creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, grow in our hearts the fruits of your Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And remove any evil weeds that are strangling our hearts, sexual immorality, worldly gods, sorcery, hatred, strife, rivalries, jealousy, fits of anger, envy, drunkenness, and anything else that keeps us from living like Christ and walking by your spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, open our hearts to new and needful ways of serving all whom we meet. Teach us to bear one another's burdens and assume unknown risks in order to share the love of Christ in a word of peace to neighbor and stranger alike. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we pray for peace in the world from the ravages of war and crime and propaganda. Raise up leaders in all nations who will yearn for justice and desire peace and work for reconciliation. Protect men and women serving in armed forces around the globe, especially those who are in zones of battle. 
be with them in the midst of death and destruction with your indestructible presence, that by faith they may know your love and experience the peace that passes understanding and receive into your eternal arms those who are killed in battle and grant healing to all the wounded in their body, mind, and soul. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Heavenly Father, you are the Lord of all creation, mountains and plains, rivers and oceans, forest lands and deserts, and they all bear witness to the majesty of your creative grace. Help us to so love your creation that each one of us desire to be faithful stewards of all the earth's resources. Use human talent and wisdom worldwide to care for the planet, its people, its creatures, and its future generations. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, draw into your divine embrace all those who may find themselves on the fringes of society. The hungry and homeless, the unemployed, children who are missing or living in situations of neglect or abuse, and all who find the struggle of their daily life more troublesome than they can bear. Bring them their daily bread. Heal their hearts and minds in relationships with new beginnings, and grant acts of love and kindness be shown them. And encourage all people, but especially the saints of your church, to show true concern and offer real hope to those in desperate need. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, be with the Hasty and Burrell families as they mourn the death of Don Hasty. Grant all who feel the sting of his passing the grace to commend him into your hands in the hope of Christ Jesus, whose blood atones for the sins of the world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Heavenly Father, hear our prayer for those who need healing, your healing touch. We pray for Harriet Morrissey that you would bring healing to her wrist. We pray for uh, Dawn and Sherry and Stephen. We also pray for the family of Ron, uh, 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 Jim, uh, I mean, uh, Matt Jimlap, as they also now mourn the death of his wife, Maggie. And then we pray for all those we lift before you in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, as we come to the table of our Lord, let us in true faith give our lives again to Jesus as our Lord, that we may show ourselves fit for your holy kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, we bring the offerings forward and sing the offertory. <laughs> I mean, lift up, let us lift up our hearts. <laughs> let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Right 
It is indeed right and for our good benefit that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Welcome to the Lord's table. Take and eat the body of Christ for you. Jesus bless you now and forever. The body of Christ for you. This is Christ's true body given in death to you, for you, for the forgiveness of all your sins. The body of Christ for you. The body of Christ for you. Welcome to the Lord's table. The body of Christ for you, Jesus bless you. The body of Christ for you, Jesus bless you. The body of Christ for you, the body of Christ for you. The body of Christ for you. The body of Christ for you, the body of Christ for you. Welcome to the Lord's table. Take and eat the body of Christ, given into death for you. The body of Christ for the forgiveness of all your sins. 
the body of Christ for you, the body of Christ for you. Welcome to the Lord's table. Take and eat the body of Christ. The body of Christ. This is Christ's body. The body of Christ for you. The body of Christ for you. The body of Christ. depart in his peace. Amen. We rise for the post-communion hymn. <clears throat> God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of a godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now the final hymn, 261.
the dismissal, forgive my bad manners, I forgot to uh, welcome our musician today. This is Miss Kim Riggs, and she'll be with us a couple more times this summer. And we thank you for your service. We're glad to have you among us. Thank you for coming today. Okay, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.